Okay, are you guys seeing my screen okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so, you know, that was a great introduction, <laughs> uh, kind of a lot, but uh, I, I did want to stress that, you know, part of, you know, my positionality and all of this comes from a bunch of different um, places, right? I, I started my career as a teacher at, um, in a Kayapuni school at YL Elementary, and then uh, we moved over to Anuenue. Um, Hula Kayapuni o Anuenue, and I wanted to acknowledge some of the layo o of Kayapuni in the room who um, I worked with to um, open that school in Anu at Anuenue. Um, I've been a parent, all my three children, my last child just um, graduated last year. All three of my children have gone through Kayapuni kindergarten through high school. Um, I've taught Hawaiian language and have, you know, just worked on Kayapuni issues as a parent, um, you know, for the last 20 years. So, you know, my, those are my perspectives. Um, and what I wanted to spend some time tonight doing in a half an hour, and I have my timer going, um, is contextualizing Kayapuni education um, in, a larger, in a larger historical context. So I know when I first started teaching in Kayapuni, there was this, um, you know, we were all very committed to um, the revitalization of language um, through education. And as I learned and worked and, you know, um, researched, I realized, I thought it was something new, right? It was new to us. And I realized that it was really part of a long history of advocacy, not just for language, but for nationhood. So tonight I'm going to spend some time um, providing that context and then um, talking about uh, some of the work that we do um, presently um, in immersion. So I'm going to start with um, the vision statement for Kayapuni um, of the Office of Hawaiian under the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. He um, no kapono okalahui kanaka Hawaii, and um, really what this is saying is that the pono or well-being or prosperity of the lahui kanaka, which is us Hawaiians or even humanity in general. Um, perseveres or continues on as a result of or because of um, uh, Hawaiian knowledge and Hawaiian wisdom. So this is the vision statement um, that was created for Kayapuni uh, probably 10 years ago. Okay, and this is sort of a map of what um, Kula Kayapuni education looks like across the state. We have 26 DOE Kayapuni schools six charter Kayapuni schools, about 3,500 students and about 180 teachers. Um, so that's the landscape we're looking at for Kayapuni across the state. And here, um, I'm showing you three uh, periods of history. Um, and, and the number of Hawaiian schools that existed throughout those periods. So um, the Hawaiian kingdom, of course, that um, goes until the 1893, the Republic of Hawaii and the territory that persists from around 1900 to statehood. And then of course, statehood in 1950, 59. Um, and you know, what is very clear and we'll go through each one of these periods separately, but um, we can see that, you know, and, and this is something that I had to learn. I did not know when I first started teaching in Kayapuni, um, but you know, the idea that the public education system, of course, was begun during the Hawaiian kingdom period by Kamehameha III. Um, and this shows, you know, the amount of Hawaiian language schools um, throughout those periods of history. So you see a huge, um, uh, increase in the early kingdom period, and then you see it slightly decrease, and then you see it sort of hit rock bottom during the Republic and the territory. And then um, post statehood, um, that's pretty, you know, like the modern period, uh, which more people are um, aware of. So we'll go through each of these. And then what do you think the um, orange line is? 
English schools. The, <laughs> what do you think is going up during the same time? English schools, right? So that's sort of a balance of uh, or a reflection of what's happening over this 200 year period. So when we look at the kingdom period, right, and, and, and this goes through one, two, three, four, five, six monarchs up until 1893, um, you know, uh, of course, you guys are probably, you know, hear this all the time. It's kind of common knowledge now that Hawaii was one of the first nations or kingdoms to have compulsory education uh, before many of the other um, nations around the world at that time in 1841. And schools, uh, Hawaiian language schools, of course, rise very quickly. And what is shown here in, in this, um, this slide is that um, you can see that through different periods of the monarchy, right, that very early on, in, in fact, I think it's 1851, um, the monarchy starts to um, there's this contestation between English and Hawaiian. So it's not something new. It's not something that started in the modern era. It really starts way back um, in the Hawaiian kingdom period. And you can see that um, as time goes on, and especially during the reign of Kalakaua, you see um, Hawaiian language schools decrease and English schools increase. Now, of course, one thing um, to remember is that during this entire period, um, Hawaiian is still the language of the government and of society. So at this time, there, you know, though the English schools are increasing, English is mainly a language of school, right? And outside, Hawaiian is still the dominant language. So that's during this, this period. Um, and then, of course, we all know in 1893, we have the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy. And um, this headline is actually from the first newspaper that's published the day after the overthrow. Um, and it really marks a time. If you read the headline, it's, you know, uh, love or aloha to lili'u o kalani o onamoku, lave ia ka mana au puni, you know, the, the power of the government is taken and it's it goes on to um, note, it's like her proclamation and she, she publishes this in the paper the next day. Um, and this really is this hard mark in our history where we lose control, right? We lose, con we lose control of all of the governmental systems that we want, that we develop, that we established and that we control. So this includes the educational system. I mean, at this time, there are about three Hawaiian schools left and about mm, a, more than, a little more than 100 English schools um, that exist in the Hawaiian nation at this time. And we hear a lot about um, this law, <laughs> right, which um, the banning of Hawaiian language. And this is, actual, this is the actual law. This is what it actually says. Um, and uh, it says that the English language shall be the medium and basis of instruction in all public and private schools. And um, any school that shall not conform to the provisions of this section shall not be recognized by the department. So this is the law that bans Hawaiian language um, in the public education system at this time. And really it says that if, if you choose to have a school, that is not in English, we won't support you, you know, <laughs> financially. We won't recognize your school. So this is the law that's passed by the Republic of Hawaii under um, the president of the Republic of Hawaii, who's Sanford B. Dole at that time, who is one of the committee of 13 who overthrew the queen. Now, <laughs> this is what Hawaiian language schools look like throughout the Republic, the territorial period, and up to statehood in 1959. There are zero Hawaiian language schools in Hawaii at that time. But that's not saying that there is not this um, contestation over language. That still continues. And in fact, um, they begin 
other English only policies. So this English only or this banning of Hawaiian language in the public education system doesn't just happen there. This is an act in 1900 where they are basically um, proclaiming uh, only English in the legislative proceedings of the territory, right? So this is a, the contestation of language is in education, it's in politics, it's all over. Um, and Hawaiians are battling. They're, they're not, you know, it, it's not like, okay, they banned the language. We didn't say anything. And in 1978, it showed up again in our constitution. There's a whole history of advocacy and uh, political and social um, battling that is happening um, in our society at that time. This is one of the things in 1903 um, where Hawaiians are trying to um, address those issues. And it, you know, this, so uh, this is uh, Fred William Beckley, and he's, um, he's actually quite an interesting guy, but he's the, um, he was a, a interpreter in the Hawaiian Kingdom Supreme Court, and he, he's the first um, instructor or professor of Hawaiian language at the university, but he is a politician and he um, attempts to proclaim this act, an act to amend section one, two, three of the civil laws so as to permit the teaching of Hawaiian language in public schools. So, you know, we hear a lot about the ban. We don't hear a lot about the advocacy that happens after that, that tries to address and reverse that ban. And this is one of those things that's ha that happens. Um, here's another bill um, that's put forward in Congress by Jonah Kuhio Kalaniana Ole. And um, this bill is trying to, um, let's see it here, make both English and Hawaiian language official languages in legislative proceedings of the territory of Hawaii. So what we see here, of course, are Hawaiians um, targeting or challenging the laws, those, these English only laws that exist in Hawaii. Um, we also can look at the social commentary that is happening at this time also. And this is just one example of many, 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 many um, articles that you can find in Hawaiian language newspapers that talks about the importance of language. And almost every time it is, it is couched in the identity, right? In the idea of lahui and in the identity of aupuni too. Um, and in this one, in this particular one, it talks about so they're talking about the loss of language and they're actually um, blaming the loss of Hawaiian language public schools as the source of this, of this, you know, the aupo that is ensuing um, surrounding Hawaiian language. Um, and in 1919, what we see is that, you know, so Hawaiians are participating in politics at this time. When you look at the um, legislative rosters, you'll see many Hawaiian names, many of the Hawaiian families that are still around today, many of our own families, we will find their names as legislators. And this is what is spawning, um, you know, this is an amendment to the to the law that banned Hawaiian language, right? So again, it wasn't just banned and came back, you know, in the 70s and 80s. Again, this is another way that Hawaiians were, were challenging those laws. And um, this, they insert this um, bolded statement into that existing law that banned Hawaiian. Um, and it says, provided, however, that the Hawaiian language shall be taught in addition to English in all normal and high schools of the territory. Right. So again, there, yes, there is a law banning Hawaiian or, you know, um, this English only policy. And in 1919, they actually changed that. Right. And normal schools were like teacher education schools. Um, and this is another, again, in 1920, it's sort of the commentary, you know, what's happening um, in the social commentary of the time. 
and it talks about ku'ulahui aloha um, and the idea that if our language disappears, we will be like, and it makes this comparison to um, American Indians and African Americans who have no um, nation and no language, you know, so it's kind of saying, hey, you guys, maka'ala, um, this, we're going we're gonna to end up like them. <laughs> we got to do something now. Um, and again, in 1920, I just think this is interesting because, you know, um, this is again, 27 years after the overthrow. Um, but when you look at what they uh, write in their report, as, as far as the, um, the history of the department, they acknowledge that it was begun during the time of the Hawaiian kingdom. And they, um, you know, they, they list the names of Lot Kamehameha and Kekua Naoa and um, people. Uh, so they, they, at this point in time, they still remember, right? We've forgot, you know, decades later, but they still remember that the history of the, of the public education system in Hawaii came from the Hawaiian kingdom. And in fact, if you walk into the Department of Education now, right, they have all the, they have all the pictures on the wall. And who's the first picture on the wall? Well, that's David Malo, who's the first inspector um, of the public education system. And I, I often wonder when I walk in there, like, does anybody who works in this office, besides the people who work in the office of Hawaiian education, do they, do they realize that? Do they know why there's a Hawaiian man at the front of this whole line of um, superintendents? Um, However, by 1927, um, and I've been scouring, uh, you know, DOE documents, all the DOE documents I can find. By 1927, what I find is that Hawaiian, um, it's not being spoken in any school as a medium of education, um, but it, it's re-described as one of the foreign languages taught in public schools, and it has, it actually has quite a extensive outline of what you teach and you know uh, standards, if you will. Um, but you know, general aims, working knowledge. Uh, it even has um, in Hawaiian newspapers, right? But again, the idea is that it has now become this foreign language in the public education system. Um, and in 1935, that same law. <laughs> that banned Hawaiian in 1896, and then again was um, revised in 1919. In 1935, it's revised again. And this is what they insert into that law. Provided, however, that the Hawaiian language sh shall be taught in addition to the English in all normal and high schools of the territory, and this is the new part, that daily instruction for at least 10 minutes in conversation or in the discretion of the department in reading and writing in the Hawaiian language shall be given in every public school conducted in any settlement of homesteaders under the Hawaiian Homes Act, right? And of course, we know that the Hawaiian Homes Act goes into effect 1920s. Um, so this is, this is an attempt, of course, to continue to challenge the English only policy in the schools, but also to make sure they're targeting, right? They're targeting our home, our, our, our homesteads, right? Where our Hawaiians, of course, are living at that time. Which I, so I think this is a very valid um, point for, you know, the idea of um, the Leeward Coast, why Anai and Nanakuli being homesteads. Um, in 1941, and I just, you know, I was trying to give an example through all of those eras about, you know, like what, what are people saying in the newspaper? And um, in this one, uh, it's emphasizing the idea that, you know, we need to, there's, there's a bill, some kind of bill, and I'm not sure which bill they're referring to, but they're saying, you know, we got to support this bill because, and, and revive our language because, you know, all of the uh, kupuna who are proficient in Hawaiian are dying. This is in 1941 already, right? So there's already that um, that consciousness that we're we're losing our language. 1941. Um, and this is again another challenge to the English only policies, where um, it states in the territorial laws that any language other than English and Hawaiian shall be deemed a foreign language. 
right? And this is in re reference to um, newspapers. So they're saying Hawaiian and English is okay, but you know other languages, because of course there are other Asian languages that have come into Hawaii at, at this point. Um, and then we are here at statehood. And we can see that from the point of statehood at 1959 until 1987 is when we have our first um, Hawaiian language school. But there are a few things that happen that you know are important to the development of this timeline. <laughs> and when I was reviewing my slides today, I was like, oh, I didn't write anything on this slide. And I was like, oh, well, that's good because really that's, it shows uh, how Hawaiian language was treated in the 1959 state constitution. It wasn't there. And, you know, we, uh, the politics around, you know, uh, the push for statehood is a whole other um, world for somebody else to explain. But what we do know about that is that it was very important at that time for Hawaii to show what great Americans they were. Right, the melting pot, how we're this great example of um, different peoples and races that you know have found um, prosperity and, and harmony in Hawaii. So when we look at the state constitution, Hawaiian is not addressed at all. Um, and this is just from 1970. Um, we see, you know, a little less than 20,000 people in 1970 who state that Hawaiian was spoken in their home as a child. It didn't, it's not that we had 20,000 speakers at that time. They're saying that when I was a child, Hawaiian was spoken. So a little less than 20,000. And really, we know that this is what fuels the Hawaiian revitalization movement, right? The, the, um, the recognition that we have few kupuna left who can speak Hawaiian. And if we don't produce another generation of Hawaiian language speakers, we are we may just lose our language. So in 1978, and you guys have heard of the 1978 KonCon, Con, it did a bunch of different things. And um, even for myself, it, you know, <laughs> recognizing how important those things were, right? We saw the blank slate of the first state constitution in um, 1959. And now we know why it was so important for um, them to include these things in um, the Con Con in 78. So um, Hawaiian education programs, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, traditional and customary rights, Hawaiian homelands, Hawaiian homelands, um, addresses Hawaiian homelands a lot, even though that was our, always around, and then official languages of the state. And I have a little, these are the people who sat on the uh, Committee of Hawaiian Affairs. Um, Frenchie Di Soto is from your side of the island. She was a fighter um, back then, and she was one of the people that um, led this initiative. Um, and there are still a few people who are around, um, like Mike Crozier and um, I saw Ricky Hokama, who are still around. And I, I keep thinking, like, I'm going to call them up and ask them, like, what were you guys talking about? What were you guys thinking about when you when you when you pushed for these changes? Um, and of course, this is when Hawaiian is. And you know, English and Hawaiian shall be the official languages of Hawaii. And it also made um, inserted Hawaiian education programs. So this is where we have the Kupuna program come out, right? The state shall provide for a comprehensive Hawaiian education program consisting of language, culture, and history as part of the regular curriculum, curriculum of the public schools. This is law, right? Um, so stemming from that, and and you know what is interesting is how we then use these laws as as um, ammunition to 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 do things in our community. So you know, uh, we have the first Punana Leo that happens in 1985. We have um, in 1986 uh, the laws are amended to include Hawaiian in public schools, and in 1987 we have our first two Kulakayapuni at Keokaha and Waiau Elementary. And this is what we look like today. Um, and, you know, I wanted to spend a little bit, you know, time talking about, you know, like the development, like how were these, these schools development? And it was a very grassroots, and it's grassroots for every single community, right? Every time a, a Hawaiian language, a Kayapuni 
um, begins in a community is because there are people, parents, kids um, who implore their, their schools to begin an education program for Kayapuni. Um, and it's a fight almost every single time. There are maybe one or two examples where, you know, the schools were like, oh yeah, sure. Um, Hawaiian was not looked upon as something that was viable in a, in a public education school system. Um, it was frowned upon, right? English, of course, was the language of choice. I have talked to a few people who were part of the Department of Education at that point in time. And, you know, and this is not just because there were no Hawaiians in the Department of Education, even the Hawaiians in the Department of Education didn't believe that it would lead to prosperity for our children. And that's, you know, kind of was the, um, the mana'o at that time. Um, at that time, the Ahakaoleo, probably the early 90s, the first life of the Ahakaoleo, where they, um, they advised the Board of Education. And we did have some very key players in the Board of Education that supported immersion education, which is what um, got immersion started and through in our Kayapuni schools. I know that some of the schools, um, you know, it's kind of terrible to think, but I know for like Maui, Pa'ia school, um, it was just up to the principal. Will anybody take us? Like on Maui, it was like, what school will take us? And the only school that took us was Pa'ia. And not because they believed in Hawaiian education, but because their school was so small, they were afraid it was going to close. So they're like, well, yeah, come. Right. And, you know, it's, it's, it's when you, when you think about the history of Hawaiian language and the political history of Hawaiian language to leave those kinds of decisions up to somebody who does, has no clue about Hawaiian language, has no clue about the history, and really has no sense of advocacy for us. But to leave those decisions up to ignorant people is really, um, irresponsible. Um, here is what the kind of organizational structure of Kayapuni looks like now. Um, of course, we have all of our schools, um, we have our parent groups, and I cannot even tell you like, our schools and our parent groups, how incredibly important they are. Like we would be nowhere without our kumu, and our parents, right? And 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 we all know that that's not always a, um, <laughs> you know, we we there there is some tension there because the it's hard being both, right? Um, but without kumu who dedicate themselves to our schools and without parents who dedicate themselves to our schools, we would we wouldn't be here. Um, and and it's a continuous fight. It's not like it's a fight to establish and then it's you know, smooth sailing. It's a continuous fight. Now in about 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, we decided to um, revive the Ahakaleo and we changed to, um, to advise the Office of Education. And this was a uh, intentional change because what we felt was that um, we needed to be closer to the structure that would um, affect our schools. Right, we needed to be in the DOE because they were responsible for um, for our schools, right? For resourcing our schools, for administering our schools, um, for uh, you know everything. So we decided to do that. And one of the things that we, the, one of the first things that we did was um, create the FAFSKI, which is the Kayapuni framework. The Kaya, the frame, the framework for Kayapuni education. And this was really um, because we felt like schools had been consumed into the mainstream, right? So we, more than ever before, we were now a part of um, mainstream curriculum and mainstream initiatives in the school. And we wanted to highlight the ways that we were different. Um, some of the other things that Aha Kaleo has worked with the Office of Hawaiian Education and the schools and the parent groups on are, you know, assessment, finally getting an assessment that was funded by the legislature. They gave a million dollars for us to finally um, uh, create that assessment, which led to us being able to create our own standards. Um, we have worked to um, revise BOE policy um, to better reflect uh, what we thought schools should be doing, uh, the DOE should be doing for our schools. Uh, we 
advocated for the teacher pay differential. And in this next legislative session, um, these three things at the bottom, those are the legislative priorities for Ahakaleo, um, creating a Kayapuni complex. And we don't know what that looks like. What we want to do is to push um, the Department of Education to rethink the way it organizes our schools so that we can be more collaborative and we're not so separated across complexes. Um, we're going to advocate for a Hawaiian education seat on the Board of Education. And we're also trying to figure out how we can create a Kumukayapuni pathway where um, the state supports scholarships for Kayapuni teachers or people seeking to be Kayapuni teachers and then also making a commitment to teaching Kayapuni. So some way to affect um, teacher education because we know that is one of the crucial, crucial things that is affecting um, education. And I'm gonna finish up and I have two more minutes. Um, you know, this is one of the things that we did in the foundational and administrative, administrative frameworks for Kayapuni education. Um, Things like this, which I know for us who have taught and parents, you know, we think that this is so common knowledge. Well, of course you have to develop and main, maintain a variety of Hawaiian language contexts. Of course you have to encourage the use of Hawaiian practices and traditions. Of course you have to support the unique educational needs of Hawaiian children. Of course you have to promote, promote Hawaiian worldviews and history. The problem is this is not common knowledge. And this is not the foundation from which many of our administrators make their decisions. And one of the things that we wanted to do with the FAFKI was to create this um, foundation, right? So that um, our teachers and our parents could, could use it the way we use the 1978 law, right? To use this to empower our schools and to improve our schools and to ho'omana our schools, right? To take back some of that power. And I know I'm out of time. And I'm, I'll just end right here. Um, and, and I just wanna, you know, I, I wanted to end by saying that, you know, I know we have challenges in immersion, but I, you know, I tell people this um, very short story, which is, you know, Kayapuni has been able to create a new generation of Hawaiian language speakers. In my own family, I've, you know, spoken to my three children in Hawaiian. We, only speak Hawaiian to our children. But in my, um, my siblings, we have 23 mo'opuna um, in my children's generation that have gone through Kayapuni. Now, when you think about Hawaiian language in your own families, this is a total reversal, right? And that would have not been, um, that would have not happened unless there was a Kayapuni because I'm the only person in my, among my eight siblings that speaks Hawaiian. But because there was a Kayapuni, they could all send their children to Kayapuni. So when we think about Kayapuni, you know, I know that you know, sometimes we, we look at you know, the, the, the issues that are happening right in front of us. But when, you know, sometimes I like to take a step back and look at you know, how this um, affects or transforms our communities and our families. And I think that if we do that every once in a while, it helps us to you know, keep some perspective and it gives us um, encouragement to keep going. But I, I'm sorry, over time, but mahalo nui, everybody. <laughs>